So welcome to UW Mini Medical School. And tonight, we're going to be talking about meditation and hypnosis. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to Shelley Weichmann. That is a German name. She is a doctor, but she's not a medical doctor. She's the better kind of doctor. So uh, Shelley is an associate professor of rehab medicine at the UW School of Medicine. She actually practices at Harborview where uh, there is a lot of trauma, there's a lot of burns, and there's a huge need for this. Oh, look, it says that on the second thing. So she's a rehab psychologist at Harborview. Uh, her client, clinical interests include adjustments to injury and disability, pain management, and pediatric psychology. Wow, is that the uh, nation's capital? <laughs> look at me, I'm in the know. Dr. Weichmann's research interests include adjustment to disability, long-term outcomes following burn injury, and the use of hypnosis and virtual reality for chronic pain management. I love that stuff. Hypnosis, virtual reality, got to do it. She received her PhD from the UW in clinical psychology and completed a fellowship in rehab medicine and an internship in psychiatry and behavioral sciences. Now, is that a picture of you in a glass elevator? Wow, Sears Tower. Did you get, like, nauseated looking down? You just had to feel the moment. You weren't really falling. All right, she's board certified with the American Board of Professional Psychology. And I would guess that those are either two of her clients or her children. That's right. All right, so tonight we're going to have a fascinating talk on the power of suggestion, hypnosis, and who doesn't want it. <laughs> and so let me introduce to you Shelley Weichman. Thank you very much. Thanks. Well, thank you for inviting me. Thanks for being here tonight. I'm very excited to talk about this topic. Um, I think it's one that's often misunderstood, so maybe I can debunk a few myths out there about hypnosis. Um, I'm just curious, how many of you have personal experience in the use of hypnosis? Okay, good. Not very many, which is usually what we find, which means that a lot of what you know about hypnosis you've probably gotten from TV and the movies, or what you learned at the state, at the state fair um, with people on the live stage walking like a chicken. Um, so most of what you know about hypnosis then is wrong. So hopefully I'll introduce you to this uh, uh, very old technique and um, uh, maybe you can find ways to uh, use it in your own life. Uh, I did want to expl uh, just explain a little bit about how I became involved in hypnosis. Um, first and foremost, I'm an opportunist. And I was working at Harborview as a grad student on the burn unit. And really, two of the foremost researchers in hypnosis are here at the UW, um, Dave Patterson and Mark Jensen. They're in the Department of Rehab Medicine. And they are experts in hypnosis, so I took the opportunity to learn from the best. And I was working with Dave Patterson on the burn unit. And for those of you who don't know a lot about burns and its treatment, it is one of the most excruciatingly painful injuries a person can go through. So not only the, is the initial burn injury itself uh, painful, but the subsequent wound debridements and the subsequent treatment that patients go through is incredibly painful. Um, they go through once, sometimes twice daily uh, wound cleaning where they debris the wound by washing off the dead skin in order to um, promote healing uh, and to prevent infection, and it's incredibly painful. And we've gotten very, very good about using uh, opiates and anxiolytics to help medicate for some of this pain and anxiety, but it's not enough. It's not enough to, to take it away. So Dr. Patterson, years and years ago, was looking for um, just adjuncts. What else can we offer these people to provide them some relief and found that the most effective thing that he did was hypnosis. So that's... Um, how I got involved with it and uh, have seen some remarkable things happen with hypnosis in a very difficult setting and that's where I still am today. So that's how I got involved with hypnosis. So this is what we're going to do tonight. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of definition, uh, explain, his, uh, explain about where it came from, talk about what exactly is hypnosis, a few theories on how they think it works, debunk some of the myths of hypnosis, 
Uh, just going to briefly talk about some evidence for its efficacy. And then if we have time, I want to talk a little bit about our virtual reality-induced hypnosis that we've been working on here for the last decade or two. And um, throughout, we're going to do a little bit of self-hypnosis in practice. Now, I'm not going to hypnotize any one person, and I'm not going to do group hypnosis. Um, but I am going to give you maybe some cues of how you can use this maybe in your own life and do some practice along the way. So what is hypnosis? Hypnosis can be defined as a procedure in which one person is guided by another person to respond to suggestions for changes in subjective experience, alterations in perception, sensation, emotion, thought, or behavior. Um, so a lot of this might sound very similar to, um, to meditation. And really, hypnosis is meditation with suggestions. And it actually depends a little bit on how meditation is done. If you're doing meditation and you incorporate suggestions with it, it's going to look a lot like hypnosis. Um, but I'll show you some other um, subtle differences. And I think what you can take away from um, hypnosis, too, is it's one more tool for your toolbox in reaching your goals or changing behavior. Um, it's not meant to replace anything, but when you look at mindfulness meditation and hypnosis, imagery, relaxation, you're building kind of a toolbox for uh, different things you could use to achieve your goals. Uh, throughout, the, throughout centuries, we've had case reports in hypnosis being used for a number of things. Um, a lot of case reports on hypnosis used for pain, and that's what we call hypnotic analgesia. That's what I'll be talking most about tonight. But hypnosis, as you've probably even seen from commercials, has been used for weight loss, smoking cessation, therapy enhancement, itch, and other dermatological conditions. And that, um, right now, I have a study going on looking at using hypnosis for itching after a burn injury. So as the burn injury heals, a lot of times people will develop really thick, red, hypertrophic scars, which causes pretty severe itching. And what we were finding in our research is um, people were coming back 5, 10, 15, 20 years later, and we'd ask them, what's the thing that bothers you most? It's the itching. I can't stand the itching. And we have not been able to find any effective treatments for the itching after a burn. And so we're trying hypnosis to see if that might work. And then also performance enhancement. I spent some time early on as a sports psychologist, and we um, were able to use hypnosis, too, to help uh, especially elite athletes really achieve a peak performance. Um, but also, um, if you're learning a new skill or learning a new sport, you might find hypnosis to be helpful in that as well. And just briefly, for hypnotic analgesia, um, hypnosis has been described um, to be effective for all kinds of pain, dental pain, cancer treatment, amputations, pain after a spinal cord injury, sickle cell anemia, arthritis, headaches, labor, childbirth. Um, it's been used for just about every ailment and condition. So I'm going to pause here for a minute uh, and see if we can start applying this. Um, you don't have to tell me what they are, but how many of you made some New Year's resolutions? Anybody make any New Year's resolutions? OK, good. Well, we're, it's February right now. So it's about a month into it. And this usually is about the time where you might a little pep talk, a little redirection and focusing on your New Year's resolutions. Um, so I want you to take a minute and just real quickly on a piece of paper, <coughs> jot down one of your New Year's resolutions you're kind of struggling with. Or if you didn't make any New Year's resolutions, just pick something in your life that you'd like to improve on or change, make better. Um, one goal that you have for this year, just quickly think of it or jot it down. And then I want you to make a list of just a couple of things that have been barriers to you accomplishing that goal or making progress on that goal. What are some of the barriers that you faced? Um, so jot that down. So for example, for me, if I were to say, um, OK, this year I want to exercise more, I would probably list a barrier as time. I just don't have enough time. That would be one of the things. Um, I might also list um, access. Um, the weather's cold. It's rainy, dark, uh, don't want to join a gym, so I don't have access to a place to work out. So those would be considered barriers. Um, then I want you to make two quick lists. Write down two unhelpful thoughts you have about accomplishing your goals. This is kind of known as cognitive restructuring or cognitive therapy. So our mind can get in the way to us accomplishing our goals. So write down two unhelpful thoughts that you might have for accomplishing that goal. 
So maybe mine might be, gosh, I hate exercising. Hate it. Um, you know, I don't like going to the gym. I don't like all those people around. That would be, those would be unhelpful thoughts. And then the flip side, what are some of your helpful thoughts? What are things that you think of that actually motivate you to, to make progress on your goal? Um, jot down a couple of those. For example, for me, it might be, um, I love what, I feel, what it feels like when I exercise. I love that feeling after I'm done with a great workout. I like the social interactions at the gym. Those would be more helpful thoughts. Okay. So keep thinking about that as we go. We're going to pause there and come back to this later. But we're going to move on now to where did hypnosis come from? Where did it start? And we traced kind of the beginnings of hypnosis back to a man by the name of Mesmer back in Paris in the 1700s. And Mesmer was a guy that believed that body tissues held energy that could be directed with magnets to help ease symptoms and heal disease. So he would put patients in this big tub of water with some metal rods, and he would wave the metal rods over them, trying to redirect all this magnetic energy. Um, these patients then would go into these convulsions, very dramatic convulsions, and they would be healed. It was a miracle. They'd be healed. Um, so the, the government formed a committee to look into this. Is this guy real? Is this legitimate? What's going on here? So the committee looked into it and found that, you know, the effects were really due to the engagement and imagination of his patients, not due to this, animal, uh, to this uh, magnetism or these magnets, but more the engagement and imagination of the patients. And the committee recommended that, that they focus and do more research and look into further on using someone's imagination to heal and to reduce symptoms. What a great idea. Um, unfortunately, it really didn't pick up for another uh, couple centuries. <laughs> kind of forgot about it. Um, and uh, Mesmer kind of fell out of favor. But we got some really cool terms out of, um, out of that era. Mesmerized, mesmerism it was called. Animal magnetism was, uh, came out of that. He believed that some people held more magnetic energy than others, and they were said to have more animal magnetism. So anyway, that was Mesmer's contribution. So like I said, a couple hundred years went by, and Charcot, who was a, neuro a neurologist in the 1800s, then would use hypnosis to um, study neurological conditions. He wanted to learn more about the brain, and that was a good technique for him to do that. Um, and by this time, uh, mesmerism became known as hypnosis. Um, Freud then stepped into the picture and used hypnosis to, to develop his theory of the unconscious mind. Um, it's not really clear why, but he actually then eventually replaced hypnosis with dream analysis. Um, some people speculate that um, you need a lot of rapport and patient rapport in order to be effective at hypnosis, and that really was not Freud's strength. Um, he, you know, he'd have patients lay on the couch facing away from him. He was sat, you know, sat way behind them, didn't make eye contact, didn't look at them, wanted to be anonymous. Um, didn't say anything usually, so, so that rapport needed just really wasn't his strength. Um, but dream analysis, I think, was more comfortable for him, so some speculate that that's probably why he abandoned hypnosis. Um, Hole came along around the 1930s and was really the first um, to start doing some controlled experiments showing that hypnosis can be used to alter a person's perception of pain. Uh, both Erickson and Hilgard are kind of considered the grandfathers of modern-day hypnosis. They really picked up on this and published a lot. Um, Erickson on his creative use of hypnosis and hypnotic language to help patients manage various symptoms and problems. And Hilgard really did some groundbreaking experiments on the effects of hypnosis and hypnotic analgesia and uh, developed his theoretical model of hypnosis. And some of those theories then that came out of um, this era, uh, the, one of them was the dissociation theory. Um, Genet and Hilgard really adopted this theory. And they felt hypnosis works because during hypnosis, there's a certain part of consciousness that can be split off from one another. You can hear and attend to one thing and completely block out another part of your consciousness. And this is a natural response to focusing one's attention on one thing in particular. And a really good example of this might be if you've ever found yourself driving a familiar route. So maybe it's from work to home. 
and maybe it's a 20, 30 minute commute, and you start out heading for home after work, and something happened at work. Um, maybe it was a problem, something great happened, or whatever, that you're really focused on. You're just thinking about it over and over again, really focused on this event that happened at work as you're driving home, and all of a sudden, you drive up in your driveway at home, and you think, oh, I'm home already. Where did that time go? Where did the last 20, 30 minutes go? Well, clearly you weren't unconscious and you weren't asleep because you made it safely, so we assume that you were able to stop at red lights and go at green lights and make the turns you needed to go and follow the rules of the road, but all of a sudden you're home and you just don't remember it. And that is the idea behind dissociation. So your mind can really focus intensely on one thing while doing something else that's on automatic pilot. And that's one um, theory behind why they think hypnosis might work. There's the sociocognitive theories. Um, these people tend to believe that people do what they think is expected of them in social situations. So people respond to hypnosis and suggestions because they think that they should and because they want to. And this theory is behind why they think stage hypnosis works. Um, we'll talk a little bit about this later, but stage hypnotists very carefully screen the people that they're going to use in their demonstrations. And they screen them for not only hypnotizability, but um, their willingness to please and willingness to buy into it and engage in the entertainment. And they really get involved, uh, engaged in the entertainment value of hypnosis. Um, so they're carefully chosen for that reason and usually leads to a very entertaining show. But they're not doing anything they don't want to do, and they're getting people who really believe that this works. Um, some of the neurocognitive theories have shown, theorists have shown that the brain activity in those who respond to hypnosis is different than the brain activity in people who do not respond to hypnosis. And usually um, it's the areas of the brain the pre known as the prefrontal cortex and the anterior, anterior cingulate cortex that light up. These are also the areas involved in the processing of pain, which is why they first got the idea that hypnosis can be used um, for pain control. And hypnosis can be used to teach people to control their overall brain activity. And what we're going to learn in a minute is you can actually tailor your hypnotic suggestions to parts of your brain. So the parts of your brain that light up under hypnosis are actually going to be dependent on the types of post-hypnotic suggestions that you're given. Um, so as you can see with these theories, they're not really mutually exclusive. You can actually believe um, or see how all three of them kind of work together to explain how hypnosis works. Okay, so what exactly is hypnosis? What's involved? Um, you don't typically have a watch that's swung in front of you, uh, and you're not going to ever do anything that you don't want to do. Um, but there is a little bit of time spent on rapport building, and then you go into a period of relaxation. Then you have the third phase is the induction, um, followed by some suggestions and post-hypnotic suggestions. And then you have a re-alerting phase. And this whole, in terms of how long uh, an exercise like this takes, it's variable. Um, usually, if you're working with a therapist or a mental health professional, your sessions last about 20 minutes, 30 minutes doing hypnosis. But eventually, we're hoping to teach you self-hypnosis. And when you practice and practice and practice this, the, you get very quick at relaxing yourself quickly, and the adduction can be speeded up to where you maybe only need three to five minutes to get into this ideal state. And a lot of times, what these research is showing that, that if you can engage in three to five minutes of hypnosis a couple of times throughout the day, you're going to have better results. So again, the time varies, and it depends on the goal that you're wanting to achieve as well. So rapport building. What exactly is this, this phase? It's really important that you engage in hypnosis with someone you trust and who knows something about you. And you don't have to have a long relationship established with the person. But trust is really the key. Um, and the reason for this is you might feel vulnerable engaging in hypnosis with someone, just as you would any type of therapy. Um, although that said, I'm always amazed at um, working at Harborview, for example. Um, I feel privileged, actually, that patients will probably pretty quickly engage in hypnosis with me after not knowing me for very long. And sometimes it's even the, in the first meeting. And if somebody is in a lot of pain, they're very willing to try various things to, to relieve the pain. 
Um, I think that part of that, though, is still trust is the key. Um, you know, I'm licensed. I'm <laughs> employed by the University of Washington. Um, I'm being bound by rules and ethical codes and laws, so, so I'm trusted. Um, but you also really need to find somebody that, that you feel comfortable with and that you work well with. Um, so rapport really is uh, a key part of it. So then you go into the relaxation phase. Um, when we're relaxed, we're going to be better able to focus our attention. You know, one of the benefits of hyp hypnosis is relaxation. And we also engage more of our senses when we're relaxed. Now, relaxation at this phase, it can take many forms. You can do deep breathing. You can do muscle relaxation. You can get, engage in some relaxation imagery. Whatever your preference is, whatever is most comfortable for you, even meditation, uh, you can engage in that during this phase. And that's something that you would uh, kind of work out with, um, with the therapist that you're working with. So I want to go back to your exercise where you wrote down your New Year's resolutions. So far, you've gotten the resolution down, the um, helpful thoughts, some unhelpful thoughts. Underneath that, I want you to jot down, we're going to do the relaxation Im relaxing imagery part, um, just jot down what's your favorite vacation spot? Where do you like to go? Um, skiing, on the beach, fishing. And we're going to take a minute here and I want you to go ahead and, um, if you want to, put your pen down, close your eyes, and I just want you to take some deep breaths with me. We're going to take about three deep breaths. I'm going to go ahead and inhale. And exhale. And just on your own, go ahead and take two or three more long, slow, deep breaths. And I want you to picture that favorite vacation spot. I want you to visualize what it looks like. I want you to see if you can hear the various sounds that you might hear when you're there. Smell, are there any certain smells that you can reproduce that you would experience when you're in your spot? Feel, anything that you can feel while you're there? And just take a minute and just experience that place in your mind. All right. That is one technique to get yourself into a more relaxed state. And the more senses you can engage, visual, sound, smell, feel, taste, the more realistic it's going to be. So the next part of um, hypnosis is the induction. And usually there's some form of counting down. So in this particular case, they're counting down six, five. They go deeper and deeper. And you will hear the therapist say that. With each number that I count down, you're going to feel even more relaxed and more comfortable. On down to one. And as you can see, this person's very suggestible, and the therapist is very effective. Um, so this part of the induction involves an invitation to really focus your awareness and attention on a single experience. And usually we say focus more closely on the clinician's voice. So I would say, I want you to focus more closely on the sound of my voice. There might be some interruptions in the hallway or in the room. And with, e with each time you notice your mind wandering, I want that be to be a cue to you to focus more closely on the sound of my voice. So you're focusing. Now, sometimes people might have you focus on a spot on the wall or an object. And I think this is where the whole watch dangling in front of you came about because people used to have pocket watches. But we don't do that anymore. Um, and then counting down. And the, counting, the countdown can take many forms as well. And this is where it really helps to get to know the person you're working with. You can use a staircase or a st stairwell. Um, it can also be a ski slope that if you are working with, um, if I'm working with somebody who's a skier, you're skiing down the mountain and you see the numbers floating past you. Um, you're floating down a river and the numbers are going past you or you're walking along a beautiful path on your hike and, you, and you're seeing the numbers count down. That's the induction phase. Um, and again, this is really where the relaxation and the focusing attention really come together. And then the next phase is suggestions. 
And this is where the clinician's gonna offer suggestions for your brain to consider responding to. There's typically many suggestions in one session. And it's also gonna include, include post-hypnotic su suggestions, which are suggestions that the benefits experienced will last far beyond the current session and become a part of how your brain works. And usually end with um, suggesting that, the experience, the comf that they'll experience the comfort of hypnosis as you go about your day. So for example, if I'm working with somebody um, for pain control, they're gonna go into wound care. Rarely am I right there in wound care with them. And the reason is there's just one too many people. Um, and two, it's, it's too hard to time it. I, I can't be everywhere at once. So I usually do the hypnosis the day before, the morning before. And I would give post-hypnotic suggestions for the person then that would sound something like, um, you may find that tomorrow in your wound care you're more comfortable than you thought you would be. Um, you may find that when the nurse puts her hand on your shoulder, you can instantly take a deep breath, relax, and you feel much more in control over the situation than you have been before. So those would be examples of post-hypnotic suggestions for at some point in the future, and it's cued by some kind of a physical cue, like the nurse putting the hand on their shoulder, and that would be a reminder to them. Um, another example you may find later today as you're looking out the window that you have a lot more control over the situation than you thought you did. Or you might find that tomorrow when you wake up in the morning and you look out the window and see the sunrise, that you're a lot more comfortable than you thought you would be. Okay, so they're all suggestions, they're not demands. And a lot of times, too, we'll say, I'm going to give you a lot of suggestions, you're going to pick the ones that make most sense to you, that you're most comfortable with. And usually a person will give be anywhere between four and 12 suggestions in one session. And you just kind of pick the ones that feel right to you, that make most sense. Um, and again, I like ending it with, you know, you're going to continue to experience the benefits of this um, session as you go about your evening or your day. The suggestions, the suggestion phase is really kind of the art of, hy of hypnosis. This is where the creativity comes in, a clinician's effectiveness comes in. This is where you really can get to know the person, figure out what works for them, figure out what, you know, what is the goal that they're working on or the behavior they need to change or want to change, and how can then you tailor those suggestions specifically for that goal. And as I said earlier, you actually get different areas of the brain lighting up depending on what suggestions um, you use. So this is really where the nuances and the art of hypnosis um, lie. So then, finally, there's the re-alerting phase. This is where you're kind of waking up again. The clinician's gonna reorient you, you, reorient you, usually by suggesting that you become more awake and alert with each number that you count. And you're counting up this time, you're starting from one, you're going to 10 instead of down. Um, if you're doing self-hypnosis, you can also give yourself the opportunity to drift off to sleep, especially if you're using hypnosis for better sleep, which a lot of people do. A lot of people use hypnosis to promote better sleep. And um, even in the hospital, I use this a lot. I might end it by saying, um, at this point, you're going to either be able to drift off to sleep in a nice, comfortable sleep, and you're going to be able to wake up whenever you're ready, and you're going to wake up more refreshed and alert. And then they can do it at their own pace. Um, so either one, you can re-alert that way, or you can let them sleep and then give suggestions for re-alerting at a different time. Okay, so I want to go back to your exercise, and given what I just said about hip suggestions and post-hypnotic suggestions, I want you just to write out two suggestions that are going to help you accomplish your goal. And a lot of times I would like to base these on what your helpful thoughts were. So when you made your list of helpful thoughts and things that are motivating to you to accomplish that goal, See if you can jot down a couple of suggestions that would help you accomplish your goal or your New Year's resolutions. Just give me a minute. Okay, so as you do that, I want to talk a little bit about hypnotizability. So can we all be hypnotized? Um, what we know is that people vary in their response to hypnosis, and a person's response to hypnosis is called their hypnotizability. And this ability tends to fall on a continuum, and it tends to be stable over time. So you're not likely going to learn to be more hypnotizable. Um, and in terms of pain, hopefully this is uh, good news, hypnotizability plays just a very small role in the outcome of hypnotic treatment for pain. So let me explain this a little further. So 
what we find, we do, um, there are some measures out there to look at hypnotic suggestibility and hypnotizability. Um, the Stanford Hypnotic Clinical Scale is one that's used most often, but not to be outdone, Harvard came up with theirs too. And um, both of these are, are equally adequate. They, they, though, they take about anywhere, it depends on the version you use, but 30 minutes to an hour to administer. So it really adds to the length of time. Now, if I'm in a hospital setting, I am not going to waste my time trying to figure out how suggestible somebody is. I'm just going to do it. And the, one of the reasons is, through all of our research, we found that it's kind of the bell-shaped curve. The majority of people are moderately hypnotizable. Great. So the majority of people are going to benefit uh, from hypnosis. But we've also found even those people that are low hypnotizable still benefit. They may not just benefit as much as those people that are highly hypnotizable. So the only reason we really take time to assess hypnotizability is for research purposes because our manuscript reviewers and our journal editors want to know when we present a study, well, how hypnotizable were, were your, was your population? we can tell them. But for clinical purposes, it's really not effective to use it to either screen somebody in or screen somebody out, because we know from all the research that most people can benefit from hypnosis. Just some will benefit more than others. So I'm actually going to switch over to myths of hypnosis. Um, one of the myths of hypnosis is hypnosis is the same as sleep. This is wrong. Um, you can go back to my driving example. You're not asleep when you're driving. Um, you're just kind of on this automatic pilot. So you don't lose consciousness during hypnosis like you do when you sleep. And they've shown that brain activity during sleep is very different than the brain activity during hypnosis. You're actually much more relaxed during hypnosis than you are when you're sleeping. Um, and instead, you can think of hypnosis as a state of focused activity. Um, <laughs> and this guy, when you awaken, you'll, ref you'll feel fresh and relaxed with no memory of changing my light bulbs. Now, to the contrary, I've never been able to actually help somebody to levitate, even though most of these cartoons, and in the media they do. Um, but one of the myths is that during hypnosis, the clinician has control over your mind. This is wrong. And this comes right from the movies. Usually when you see hypnosis in the movies, they're using it for evil. Um, they have evil intentions, and they're trying to control somebody's mind and make them go do something awful. Um, that they don't really want to do, but because the clinician has control over their mind, they're doing these terrible things. Um, can't happen. People cannot be forced to do anything under hypnosis that they might not normally do. So unless they already had evil intentions that they're going to do something, you can't force that in somebody. Um, and in fact, experienced clinicians are, will usually choose words like, um, and word their suggestions in a way that allows you to choose whether or not a suggestion will be helpful and just to ignore the rest. Um, I like to go back to the stage hypnosis again, and a lot of times with stage hypnosis, you see people doing embarrassing things, but it's not against their will. They're, they're, they're willingly doing that for um, the entertainment value, um, which is why they carefully screen those people out for, you know, pe they screen in people that want to entertain and are going to go along with the show. Only those who are gullible can be hypnotized. This is also wrong. Um, in fact, it takes a certain amount of concentration to be able to benefit from hypnosis. So those with severe brain injuries or cognitive, cognitive disorders may not be able to engage in hypnosis. And we really haven't been able to identify a certain personality trait that allows us to predict who's going to benefit and who's not. Um, we do hypnosis in kids, but not really under the age of five, because under five they just don't have the cognitive ability to focus for that long and to pay attention for as long as I might need them to. So it's usually about six and above. And again, I don't tend to use it with people with real, real severe brain injuries that can't focus. Um, again, our other levitator here saying, I wasn't even hypnotized. I heard every word you said. Uh, another myth. If you do not experience a deep level of focused attention, then the treatment will not be effective. Again, this isn't true. And there's, there's no evidence that attaining a deeper level of hypnosis leads to better outcomes. Um, another myth is that you must remember everything that the clinician has told you in order to benefit. This is also wrong. There should be no effort at all placed at remembering everything that is said. Your mind, the one that's on automatic pilot, is going to remember what it needs to, and the rest it's going to let go. So there shouldn't be any effort at all um, in hypnosis. 
talked a little bit about why stage hypnosis is not the same as clinical hypnosis. Again, the goals are very different. It's entertainment versus somebody helping you to use your natural abilities to feel better. And usually no rapport is built during stage hypnosis. They might spend a little bit of time chatting with them, but there's not a lot of real trust or rapport there. Okay, evidence. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there's been just hundreds of case reports in the literature about the use of hypnosis and the eff efficacy of hypnosis. Um, but until we really start doing empirically based studies, it's not going to gain the attention that it needs to. And we've actually come a long way in the last decade or so. Um, Montgomery, Dumoulin, and Red looked at 18 studies that use hypnosis for pain and found that hypnosis provided pain relief for about 75% of the populations that were studied. Um, Patterson and Jensen in 2003 looked at 17 randomized controlled trials of hypnosis and found that hypnosis was just as effective as other forms of pain relief and more effective than the placebo. Um, in terms of dose, how many sessions do you need? We're not sure. That's one thing that we're continuing to research right now. Usually we stay somewhere between four and eight sessions. Uh, the study that I'm doing right now with the itch, um, we're giving them four sessions of live hypnosis, but then I'm also making them a tape of our um, session, and then I'm asking them to listen to the tape as much as they want to on their own, and then we're just recording how often they listen to it to see if those who listen to it more benefit more or doesn't, doesn't it matter. Um, some others are doing, looking at eight sessions. Um, as always, we're trying to find out what's the lowest dose you need in order to maximize the benefit. And as far as lasting effects, um, how long does it last? Again, we're not sure. We're looking at that still. Um, but Jensen, in some of his research, has shown that um, uh, the effects can last at least up to three months. And just real quick, he looked at 37 patients with spinal cord injury and chronic pain, um, and they were assigned to either a hypnosis or an EMG-assisted relaxation group, which is essentially biofeedback. They got 10 sessions of treatment. They were assessed before and after treatment and at three months. And they found that both groups had similar immediate substantial effects on pain intensity. Hypnosis, though, was more effective than biofeedback for average daily pain. Hypnosis had a longer effect of decreased pain um, and found the effects to last three months. And although treatment outcome was variable, 80% continued to use the skills up three months. They describe benefits of being pain reduction, increased control over pain, and relief over having a new tool to handle the pain. But even though it was used for pain, they also reported non-pain benefits, including a more positive mood, increased sense of well-being, increased energy, better sleep, increased awareness, lower blood pressure, decreased frequency or thoughts. The only negative side effects, one person or three percent said it just didn't work. It was not as effective as I had hoped, or the effects didn't last as long as I had hoped. But can you imagine if we had a drug that was effective in this many, in 80% of the patients, where the only side effect was that it wasn't as effective as they wanted or didn't work, and who, where the patients continued to use it for three months after, um, we would think we'd hit on a miracle drug. Basically, hypnotic analgesia is more effective than no treatment and more effective than some biomedical treatments, like PT and medication. Um, it has specific effects over and below the placebo, and response to hypnotic treatment is variable. Self-hypnosis is easy to learn. The side effects are overwhelmingly positive, um, and it can actually enhance the efficacy of other types of ther therapies like cognitive therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy. And I just wanted to just show this picture. This is the other thing that we're kind of working on right now called virtual reality-induced hypnosis. Um, Dr. Patterson and Hoffman have been working on this for the last decade or so, where you can put somebody in a virtual world and take them through a hypnotic induction via the virtual world, and that actually eliminates the need for a clinician to be at every setting. And so we're trying to get this out into more of the rural areas where you might not have a therapist trained in hypnosis, but people can still benefit. Um, so this has been one of the things that we've been working on with virtual reality-induced hypnosis. So I will stop there. And are there questions in the audience? I see we have one over here. Yes. I'm wondering, uh, you say that you don't use the hypnosis on 
children under five or on people with severe brain injury, is there anything that you can use with either of these groups? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a lot of different forms of relaxation. Uh, with kids under the age of five, I'll use imagery. I'll just take them through some type of relaxing imagery, probably usually for a shorter time where their uh, need to focus isn't quite as great. Um, and also just deep breathing uh, would, helps as well. Um, I'm curious, after uh, someone has had experience with a, a licensed uh, practitioner of hypnosis, um, is there ev any evidence that the uh, self-hypnosis is more or less effective than the uh, practice with the clinician? That's a, that's a great question. We're actually trying to look at that. Um, usually, to this point, all, the, all of our studies have really involved um, training somebody to do self-hypnosis. So they still engage with the therapist. Like I mentioned in my study, maybe it's only four sessions, but then they're asked to engage in self-hypnosis the rest of the time. And that's one of the effects we're trying to find, too, is do you need fewer sessions? Can you just do one session with uh, a practitioner and the rest of it self-hypnosis and be just as effective? So we're looking at that. It's a great question. So this question is kind of like directed to both practices. Um, it was kind of dealing with like a, um, has any study been done to like try to correlate like a patient's initial attitude coming into the treatment and how that um, leads to the success of the treatment? That's a great question. That's a great question. Do you have so you're talking about kind of expectancy effects. And we've looked at it within a lot of our virtual reality hypnosis research. Um, how much did you expect this uh, technique to work? And we do find a correlation. The more that they believe it'll work and expect it to work, the better it's going to be. Meditation. Yeah. We, uh, there aren't studies that I know of. You know, we had so many conversations about this prior to our last study, and we're like, we're so excited to measure this, and somehow that one question did not make it into our assessment battery, and we're still pulling our hair out. Um, anecdotally, I worked with a lot of folks who are mandated to treatment, um, versus who are there voluntarily, like in a private practice setting. It feels very different. I would say it's challenging clinically if someone's not intrinsically interested in that kind of work to get them there. And yet we still see these promising outcomes. So I'm not really sure. And I think it is a really important question. You know, for me, one of the contraindications of hypnosis is somebody doesn't want to do it. So if somebody says, oh, I don't believe in that stuff, I will never try to convince them otherwise. Because you need that, that's a huge expectancy effect. If they don't expect it's going to work, it probably won't. Yeah, because um, the reason I'm asking is because, like, someone who's not interested coming in, but then finds, like, the spark to carry on the treatment, could somehow, like, you know, have, like, a better outcome yeah. than someone who's positive from the beginning. So, I mean. Maybe more for years. Yeah. Yeah, again, anecdotally, I've seen yeah. that, um, and I've seen it go the other way. But yeah. I do think it is a really important question, especially. Well, in, in all treatments, but in addictions treatment where people are often mandated or there is sort of their kicking and screaming, um, and is this a good program for those folks to go into if it's not something that they're really interested in, so, okay. ethically and in terms of effectiveness. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Now I'm completely, totally confused because <laughs> while on a stage, I was aware of everything, okay. yet I was doing what he was telling me, <laughs> and I was, uh, absolutely positive that I am not hypnotizable type of person because I, I knew everything what's happening. But now I understand that hypnosis is actually what you said, it just following what you were told to do. So was I hypnotized or not? Now I'm confused. Well, <laughs> uh, you know, I think that that's all consistent. You probably were doing what you were asked to do because you wanted to. He probably wasn't making you do anything you did not want to no, do, right? No. Yeah. yeah, he was telling me something like And you remember thing. everything. Oh, okay. Yeah, and you remember everything. I um, remember everything. You were conscious, you weren't asleep. Yeah. I, you know, Who knows, you know. right? But I think the more important thing, you weren't embarrassed, which is important. I wasn't. Good, and that's important. <laughs> All right. I've never heard of meditation or like hypnosis to like treat like burn victims or things such as that, so. Yeah. Do you want this to be like a universal thing in like every treatment plan, or like do you think it should be like m more policies directed towards mm -hmm. integrating this more into more practices of medicine? 
I'm less concerned about what specific technique you would choose, but like we just wrote some standards of practice, for example, for the burn world, the burn community, on what they should offer in a verified burn center. And one of the recommendations is you need to offer non-pharmacological uh, treatments for pain. The drugs just aren't going to do it. Now, I don't care if it's meditation or hypnosis or relaxation or imagery or biofeedback, but there needs to be something besides just medication. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that should become standard of practice. Yeah. Also, I think the Western world of medicine has been slow to adopt these techniques, and they're becoming increasingly uh, aware that they can be quite valuable in many parts of medicine. And yeah. I'm a gastroenterologist. People use uh, mindfulness for reduction of irritable bowel syndrome, mm -hmm. symptoms from that. So it can be incredibly helpful for problems that can be quite hard to solve. And more and more there's training programs for physicians to learn these techniques so they can incorporate it into their general practice with their own patients. Have you had a hard time at all um, with physicians like accepting this kind of treatment plan? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. People in the trainings we do self-select in, so if they're there, you know they're interested. And if you guys are here, you probably have some openness to it. Um, and uh, when we've gone into agencies to do research, there's certainly some. I think there's a lot of misconceptions. I'm guessing for you too. There's a lot of misconceptions about what we're doing, and I think sometimes even calling it meditation is a problem um, mm -hmm. because people have all sorts of ideas about what that means, and it's sort of airy fairy. It's not real. It's the uh, so I think a lot of it is about education, yeah. and then of course people can make their own choices, but at least they should be informed. Choices. And that's where the research is really important too. I think once we started showing that you can decrease hospital length of stay when you use hypnosis for pain control, mm -hmm. you increase patient satisfaction, you, increase, you decrease infection rates. Once we were able to show that hard data, yeah. it, people bought in. Well, we want to thank you for joining us tonight and we do hope that you'll come back next week for another invigorating uh, episode of Mini Medical School. <laughs> Thank you.